before we read our first passage of scripture, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory. We're going to read from Psalm 51, uh, which is a psalm that David wrote. But to kind of give you the story behind the psalm, so David was king of Israel, and uh, when his men were off to war, and he should have been off to war, which there's a, a message there about not doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing, so that's, you know, opens the door for the enemy to, to tempt you. But he, he's not off to war with his people. Um, he's walking around his palace as the king, and he sees this woman bathing in her house. Um, I would assume because of his position, it was probably pretty easy to like see in the windows at that time. So he sees this woman bathing, and he's like, man, she's, she's really good looking. And he says, I want her. So he sends his men to go get her, and she comes, and he sleeps with her. And she is the wife of one of his men. And so she's not a married, or she is a married woman, and, uh, and he sleeps with her, and she gets pregnant. And uh, so, you know, he's probably at first, like, panicking, like, oh, man, like, Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, or Bathsheba's husband, is off fighting in war, but somehow she gets pregnant, like, this is going to get found out. Like, there's not really any way to hide that. Um, and so he's like, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to call Uriah back. I'm going to say, hey, send Uriah back. And uh, he, he brings Uriah back from the front lines of the war, and he sends him home. And he's thinking, okay, well, if Uriah will go home and sleep with his wife, and then get, get you know, it'll look like he got her pregnant. But Uriah, being a man of honor, is just like, well, I'm not going to go into my home, and I'm not going to sleep in my own bed, and I'm not going to sleep with my wife because... Um, my men are on the front lines. Like, how, how would I feel honorable doing that? So he doesn't. So David goes, okay, I got another idea. He's like, why don't I get him drunk? Because we know drunk people make bad decisions. So he's like, what if I get him drunk? And then I'm going to send him home. So he has him over, and he makes him eat food and drink. And still, Uriah's like, no. He ends up sleeping on the couch, which is, you know, pretty normal for drunk people, too. So he ends up falling asleep on the couch, never makes it home, and uh, never sleeps with his wife. So David's like, okay, well, now I don't know what to do um, because... You know, I, couldn't, I can't cover it up with this. So he's like, I'm going to send him to the front lines of the war, and I'm going to tell my generals to pull back and let him get struck down, let him be killed by the enemy. And so David basically plots to have this guy murdered, and it, it happens, and he goes through with it. So Uriah dies. Bathsheba's now left a widow. So what does David do? He says, well, I'll marry her. So he marries her, makes, him, makes her his wife, and, uh, and now it's covered up. You know, now if she gets pregnant and has a baby, well, it makes sense. Like, she's married to David. It, it probably worked. And everything kind of continues on. Child is born. Everything kind of continues on. till God reveals this to the prophet Nathan. And Nathan goes to David and says, David, God knows what you did. I know what you did. And David realizes in that moment, oh, man, I'm found out. And he is torn with regret and with sorrow and with sadness. And so that is where Psalm 51 picks up, is where... David just got confronted by Nathan about sleeping with Bathsheba and having this great conspiracy to cover it up. So he lied, um, he committed adultery, he committed murder. Um, and so just a lot of sin coming with a lot of regret. So if you guys would rise with me, we'll read Psalm 51, and then we will jump into the rest of the message here. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure, and build up the walls of Jerusalem. 
Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. All right, you guys can be seated. So the first thing that I want to talk about when it comes to regret is that when we sin, we should feel regret. There is a place. You might hear some people say, well, I don't regret anything in my life because everything that I've ever done and every way I've ever been has brought me to who I am today. And I do think that there's some kernels of truth there in the sense that like, God is sovereign and uses everything. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But there is a very real sense where we should have regret. If we sin, if we make a mistake, if we offend God, if we hurt other people, we should feel regret. We should feel remorse. We should feel sadness about that. Um, it's, it's not only needed, but it's, it's healthy. Uh, I heard a pastor say once that regret is to the soul what pain is to the body. I'll say that again. Regret is to the soul what pain is to the body. So pain is a warning sign. Pain is a symptom. Nobody likes pain, but in a world where we die and can bleed to death, pain is something that helps protect us and it's something that helps guard us. Uh, you reach out and you touch a hot pan or a hot burner and you pull your hand away, guess what? You felt that pain and you remember that. You remember that so you don't ever do it again. You know, you get pain in a spot in your body and it could be a sign of something bigger. It could be a sign of some sort of a disease, maybe like a, a tumor or some growth or something. So pain <coughs> is a symptom of a bigger problem and it's showing you that, hey, something might need to be removed here. Well, regret does the same thing. When you sin and you feel that regret like you should, it's a, it's a sign to your soul, it's a sign to your spirit, hey, there might be a problem here. There might be something that I need to do differently. There might be something that I need to remove. So regret should be felt when we sin. We can look and see an example of this in Luke 22. Let me find it here. One of the, uh, one of the apostles, one of the disciples, um, sins, and I want you to see his reaction to it. It says, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So Peter denies Jesus. Denies knowing him, denies following him. This is after he spent three years following the guy. And he denies him out of fear, out of worry, out of concern for what was going to happen. And his reaction isn't, well, you know, it's just going to make me a better person. No. Like, it cut him. It cut him deep. He wept bitterly. So I want to say that when we feel regret, it's, it's okay to feel it. I don't want us to look at regret as a bad thing. It, it is a good thing. There's, there's a reason and a season for it. Um, and we should feel it when we sin. We should also remember regret and learn from it. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 12. Ephesians 2. This is, this is, a, this is a passage where Paul is speaking to the, F, the church in Ephesus. And uh, if you notice in this while we read it, he's reminding them of who they once were. I think it's important for us to remember this. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, you, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So I'm just going to pick a couple of things throughout here of the way that Paul is reminding the Ephesians of who they were. He says that they were dead people. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. He said that they followed the, they followed the world, so they were worldly people. They followed the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the devil. So they were followers of Satan and the devil. It says that they had a spirit of disobedience, that they lived in passions for their flesh. They lived for their passions. They lived for their flesh. They carried out desires of their body, desires of their mind. They were children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. It says a little bit farther down, it says they were separated from Christ. They were alienated from Israel. They were strangers of promise and strangers of the covenant. They had no hope, and they were, out, they were without God in the world. So Paul doesn't have any problem reminding them of who they were. And I think that it's important that when we have that regret that we do remember it. Um, I think there's, there's two main reasons why. Is one, it helps us stay humble. When he's talking about in here, he says, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Our salvation uh, Jesus saving us has nothing to do with us. When you read through this, this is like total depravity. <laughs> like their mind is messed up. Their body is messed up. Their heart is messed up. Everything about us was bad. Everything about us was terrible. Um, the, we are not a hero in the story of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the only hero. We bring nothing. No, we don't bring nothing. We bring worse than nothing. We bring bad. We bring evil. And we have to remember that because it had nothing to do. Our salvation had nothing to do. It was Jesus that did everything. And so it helps us to, to not get arrogant and to not get prideful and to remain humble and knowing that we didn't do anything to deserve this. We actually brought a lot of really bad baggage to the table. Um, I also think it's important to remember our regret because it helps us to learn from it so that we don't make the same mistake again. When you sin and when you feel that pain and you don't forget it, the next time you're tempted with that sin, you can think back, no, I, I know what this did last time. I saw the betrayal in my wife's face. I saw the fear in my child's eyes when I got loud and yelled. Um, I saw the, the trust that was broken. I still feel that trust that was broken um, that I'm trying to restore. You can say, I, I remember what it was like to be addicted. I don't want to go back and do that drug again because I, it took a ton to get out of that. I remember that addiction. I remember the drinking. I remember the, the, the lust and how it overran my life because I was always looking at things I shouldn't have been looking at and thinking about things I shouldn't have been thinking about. When you remember that pain, and you remember that regret, it helps you to not go back to it. You can use that as a fuel to be like, I don't want to go there again because, yeah, right now in this moment, Satan and temptation is making this look good, but I remember how bad it really was. I remember the consequences of that sin and how miserable it really was. And so I've been talking now for a while, and you're like, Jonathan, I thought you were going to help us get through regret. <laughs> so far, all you've told me is, that I'm a terrible person <laughs> and that I should feel like a terrible person and that I should always remember that I'm a terrible person. <laughs> and you're like, where's the good news, right? Um, and there is good news because it doesn't stop there. And I think if we stop there, we'd make a really big mistake. If we stop there, and this is where I've struggled. I'm sorry. This is where I've struggled in my personal life is that I've gotten stuck there before. And I think when we get stuck there, that's where the lies of the enemy come in. That's where hopelessness comes in. That's where 
purposelessness comes in. That's where despair comes in. That's where you start thinking, is it even worth living? Like, I'm so bad. Could I even, is it even worth living? And Satan just piles it on too. He's like, no, it's not. Go hurt yourself. He says, you're not, you're not worth anything. God doesn't love you. God couldn't forgive you. They'll never accept you. If they knew who you really were, they wouldn't, they'd have a problem with you standing up here. I feel that right now. Like if they knew who you really were, if they knew what you had done, there's no way that they'd let you speak. If we stay there, then the lies of the enemy start piling on. And if we decide to believe those, we can go down a really dark path. So I know I said that we need to remember it, but also we need to forget our regret. And you're like, okay, well, how do I remember it and forget it? And I know that's, that there's a dichotomy there, but I'm not just making it up. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Also, Paul, the one that we just read about in Ephesians, see what he says here, chapter 3, verses 13. He says, Brothers, I do not consider what, that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature this way think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So what he's saying is we do have to remember it to learn from it, and we have to remember it to be humble, but we can't live there. We do have to let go of the past, and we forget it, forget about that, and start pushing forward, and start holding on to the promises, the truth that we have attained. I'm going to read another uh, scripture here. It's 2 Corinthians 7. I have a lot of scriptures, but I think the Bible is better than anything I got to say. So we'll go to 2 Corinthians here, uh, chapter 7, verse 8. So Paul wrote a letter here to the Corinthians, and he hurt them with this letter because they were doing some, some stuff they shouldn't have been doing, like we talked about. And uh, he says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And I don't think I included this one, but I'm going to read it too. He says, For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So he's talking about a godly grief here. He's talking about a godly regret, a godly sorrow, and he says, it's a good thing. It produced something good. He says it produced repentance. And repentance leads to salvation without regret. So we have to let go of it to an extent. We can't live there. We need to be pulled through our regret into repentance and into the promises of God. He says, I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. They didn't stay there. Instead, they trusted the promises that Paul had already preached to them. They let that grieving happen. They regretted what they did, and then they pulled through into repentance, and then that pulled them through into salvation again. So you see here, he says, for what are, he says, for see what earnestness this godly grief produced in you, eagerness to clear yourselves, indignation to do the right thing, fear of sin, longing for God, zeal. I mean, like, it, it, it draws them into a good place if we let our faith do that. Now, if we don't let our faith in the promises of God do that, like I said, we'll get stuck in regret, and that leads to death. That's the worldly grief. That leads to death. So we can see in Matthew 27, verse 3 through 5, um, we're going to look at uh, another person that was grieved, but this time it didn't, he didn't use his faith to pull through. It says, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Sounds like a good thing to say, right? Like, he recognizes, oh, I sinned, I screwed up. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourselves. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. So we have Peter, the godly grief, and we have Judas, the worldly grief. 
We have Peter, the godly regret, wept, felt it, wept bitterly. And we have Judas, the worldly regret. The difference between worldly and godly regret is what's the focus of the regret? Is it God? Is it a God-centered regret? Is it a, oh, I offended God. I want to get back into a right relationship with God. I want to be reconciled to God. Or is it just the world? Is it just man-centered? Like, oh, man, everybody's going to know that I did the wrong thing. Or my ego is hurt. Like, I feel embarrassed. I feel ashamed. Has nothing to do with God. Has nothing to do with offending God or trying to get right with God or trying to build a relationship back with God. And it's just, it's just self-centered. The word regret and the word repentance are pretty similar. One, I'm going to try to say these right in there in Greek, but one says metamelamai is regret and metanoe, noe, something like that, is repentance. So they're, they're, they're close. Meta means change in the Greek, but the mellow is like a change of emotion and a change of opinion or a change of consideration on something. Whereas, and that's regret. So something happens and you're like, ooh, I don't feel good about that emotionally, I don't like that. But the type of godly regret that pulls into repentance is metanoeo, which is a regret of the way that we think. Not like I changed my mind, but like my thought process is different now. I'm thinking different. My mind is different. My being is different. I'm a different person. That's what we need. So yes, we're going to feel the regret, but we need to make that be something that changes us. We need to let that be used by God to change us into who he wants us to be. We can't just stay there. And again, we do that by knowing and trusting in his promises, having faith in his promises. So I'm going to finish up with just a couple more things here. Um, So we've talked a little bit about regret, its purpose. We should feel it. We should remember it. We should also forget it. And we should also use it as something that helps leads us to repentance and salvation. Um, But how do we do that? So I want to just kind of go through some practical things. We've talked about the what, and I want to kind of talk about the how. How do you make this actually active in your life? And I'm a heavy believer in, like, if you want to build your faith, you got to do it through the Word of God. Faith comes through hearing the Word of God. And so I come up, I I think there's, there's fighter verses, and there's things that you can pray over your own life when you're struggling with regret, when you're like, man, I'm in this deep, dark place, and I feel like I did some really bad things. Um, So the first thing that I think we need to do if we want to overcome this regret to move through this process to the end um, is we have to confess our sins. We see this in 1 John 1, 5 through 10. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So the first thing we have to do is we have to confess our sin. And the Bible says, here's the promise, the Bible says that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we don't have to stay there. We start by confessing it. We go to God and we get in agreement with him and we say, you're right, Lord, what I did was wrong. What I did was sin. What I did offended you and it hurt other people. And I'm sorry and I want your forgiveness. And his promise is he'll give it. He'll give it. The next thing we do is we repent. Let's go to Acts. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. It says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of may times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the, send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So first, we confess our sins. We align with God on the sin. Second, we repent. Um, like I said, repenting is metanoeo. It's a complete change of who you are. 
I like how he says here, repent therefore and turn back. The, the translation of and turn back is literally like to turn around and come back. So it's not even just to turn around away from something. It's not turning away from sin so much as it's turning around and coming back to God. That's what he's wanting. That's, what, that's how we overcome regret. That's how we stay out of the dark place is we, we confess the sin and we, and we turn back to God. And he says that he'll blot it out. The, the way that blotted out is translated, I think, is a, is a weak translation. It could also be translated obliterate. I mean, like, these are eliminated. It's not just that your sin is like, oh, I forgive it. It's like, it's gone. Like, he wipes the slate clean. All this stuff that you did is completely wiped away. Blotted out is like, it's like plastering a wall and smoothing it out. It's like taking a, a, an engraving in clay and smoothing it out, pushing the clay down and smoothing it all out. Like, they're erased. They're gone. And how awesome is that? that? That is what our gospel has. Because there's nothing else that we can do. We can't forgive those sins. We have that guilt. That is, that's on us. But God offers to forgive it. God paid a heavy price in Jesus Christ to forgive that sin. So again, we confess, we repent, and then we believe. We believe God's promises. We believe what Jesus did on the cross I got a few verses for this. I'm going to go pretty quick on these ones. So go to Colossians 2, 13. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses, in the, the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made to li- alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Again, he, he forgave it. He took, it's, it's, okay, I'm going to pause here for a sec. But it's interesting because I've, I've heard people say before, how does a holy, loving God let bad things happen in the world? How does, how does he let this bad thing happen? In the world? And I'm like, well, you don't really understand the context or the perspective of the Bible because the question isn't how does this holy, loving God let bad things happen to me? The question we should be asking is how does a holy perfect, righteous, just God, let us live. (laughs) I mean, he's perfect, he's holy, he's right in every single way, and we spit in his face and say, ah, I'm going to do what I want. How does that perfection, a being that's that perfect and that holy, tolerate us and deal with us? The real question is, how does he forgive us and let us live and give us eternal life? Because that's not very just. It's not what we deserve. He does it right here. He says he canceled the record of debt by putting it on Jesus. So he made a way for that wrath to be poured out on man in the form of Jesus. He poured it out on Jesus so that he could say, okay, the wrath side of my justice and my holiness and my righteousness has been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled through Jesus' work on the cross. Now what's left is the righteousness of God that gets put on you my righteousness because of the perfect life that Jesus lived, you now get that. So I don't see you the way that I once saw you. You're not a child of wrath anymore. You're now a child of love and a child of life. Another verse that backs this up is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though... We once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we get the forgiveness side taken care of. It's like, okay, so I've got this regret, and you're telling me, Jonathan, it's forgiven. The guilt, the shame, it's it's wiped away. God has completely eliminated it. But I still kind of made shipwreck of my life. I still hurt these people. Maybe I, maybe I had a divorce. Maybe I abused a person. I mean, I don't, I don't know what your guys' sins are, but maybe you abused somebody. Um, maybe you've committed crimes. Maybe you're going to have to have a felony. I mean, like, 
you're gonna have to do some jail time. Like you've, you've, maybe some of your mistakes and some of your regrets have long lasting effects like that. And you're like, well, what, what about that? Like, sure, I feel forgiven, that's great, I feel better, but my life's still completely a wreck and I have no idea how anything good is gonna come from it. God can do something with that too. So we're gonna read two passages here. Again, these are what I call fighter verses. These are things to pray against or to pray when you're feeling those feelings. Romans 8, 20, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. No matter how much of a mess you make of your life, God can still do something good with it. He can still restore. We see in Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter went on to be one of the greatest apostles. He ended up being like a leader of the disciples. And this is the guy who completely denied Jesus when Jesus was going to the cross. I'm going to tell you one other story here. So I think everybody knows, if you look, Jesus was a descendant of David. It was one of the prophecies was that Jesus was going to descend from David. Um, and you can see Jesus' genealogy in Matthew. kind of shows you where he came from. It also shows you Jesus' genealogy in Luke. And so we all know that Jesus is a descendant of David. But get this. Who do you think his great, 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 great grandma was? Bathsheba. When you look back at the lineage, Jesus was a descendant of the mess that David and Bathsheba made. The sin, the thing that we started with, that terrible stuff that David did, brought about one of the greatest miracles, well, the greatest miracle. So don't tell me that God can't take your mess and turn it around and make a miracle out of it. He did it with David. So then the last thing that we need to do is we need to rejoice and we need to tell others. This is how you overcome regret. You confess your sins, you repent, you believe in God's promises, that you have salvation, you have faith, and his sacrifice and the way that he made. And you believe that he can turn your life around and then he can do something great with it and let him start doing something great with it. And then you rejoice and you tell others. Look with me at Romans 5, 1 through 11. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, when we had done nothing deserving of it, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So you hear in here, he's talking about rejoicing. He says, rejoice in the hope. Rejoice even in the suffering. At the end, he says, rejoice in God through Jesus Christ. We have to rejoice. We have to bring that joy back into our lives because we have been saved and God has promised us amazing things. And I'll end with this one. We'll go full circle and bring it back to Psalms where we started, Psalm 51. We're going to go to specifically to verse 8. This is where we have to tell others. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. We talked about how God did that. He's going to heal us. He's given us joy. He's hidden his face from our sins. He's blotted out all of our iniquities. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God's done that now. He says that we are a new creation 
He's given us a new spirit. He's given us a new heart. He says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. He's done that. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Jesus poured it out on us. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Jesus has fulfilled that promise. He's given us salvation. And he's promised to never leave us, never forsake us, and to always be with us. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. When we have this, what we need to do is go tell other people that they can have it too. They don't have to stay living in regret. They don't have to stay living in that despair. They don't have to stay in that place where all these bad things that they've done are weighing them down. And that's what God had to tell me. He's like, you don't have to stay here, Jonathan. Like I said, I stand before you a really sinful, broken person. And, uh, and God has brought me out of that. God has said, you don't have to stay there, Jonathan. That's not who you have to remain. You don't have to continue to think about it. You don't have to live in it. Um, focus on my promises. Focus on what I've done for you and who I'm going to make you be. 